Let's pray together. Oh Lord, now we pray that you would open our eyes to see the wonderful truth of your word. And more so, Lord, we, open, we pray that you would open our hearts to receive it so that we would leave as people on fire for you as the saying would go. Lord, we pray that you would set us ablaze so that we would be a light in the world after Christ. Comfort our hearts with the truth that you have provided for us in Jesus, a generous king, a gracious savior who has blessed us with abundant blessings in the heavenly places. Lift our souls with this news. Continue to lead us by your grace. In your name, amen. Well, please turn in your copy of God's perfect and holy word to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49. I remember when I was growing up, sometimes my family and I would have formal family meetings. Any of you have those before? Sometimes it would take place in the living room. Sometimes it would take place at the kitchen table. Sometimes it would take place in the car before we went into someone's house and they say, no matter what's on your plate, you will grin and eat it. Sometimes the meetings were good, exciting news. Sometimes they weren't so good when we were in trouble. One of the better ones that I remember ended in exciting vacation news that we were going to enjoy. One of the worst ones I remember came when my sisters and I had had a long day of arguing outside And my sister was called upon to go fetch a hickory. Now, some of you young kids don't know what a hickory is. (laughs) Uh, I won't make it sound like I know a bunch about it. I think it happened one time in my life with a hickory. But if you don't know what it is, ask your parents afterwards. Better yet, ask them to show you how one works. (laughs) Today, we come to the penultimate sermon in our series in Genesis, and we'll see a big formal family meeting. It doesn't happen around the dinner table. It doesn't happen in the car or the living room. It happens around the deathbed of Jacob. He's on the brink of death, and he calls his sons in for one final speech to give to them. And in it, he will prophesy to them what their futures will look like, how they will unfold in the years to come. The entire point of Genesis has been for God to bring back a remnant of humanity to himself, no longer to be rebels of him, but to be sons and daughters of his. And the whole point of Genesis is the beginning of God's plan to make that so. And God promised that he would bring back this remnant of people through one family line, through Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. And now it's going to spread to Jacob's 12 sons. And it's here that we, were, that we see Jacob calls them in. He's going to tell them, sons, this is what your future will look like. And he gives them one final blessing, and to some, a curse. So look in Genesis chapter 49, we'll begin in verse 1. Then Jacob called his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel. O my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion. And as a lioness, who who dares rouse him? 
The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of all of, of the people. Binding his foal to the vine and the donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Verse 13. Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships and his, bro and his border shall be a Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, so he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant to for at forced labor. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a servant in the Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that the, his horse his rider falls backward. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Verse 19, raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. Verse 20, Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal de delicacies. Verse 21, Neptali is a doe let loose that bears fruitful, beautiful fawns. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by the spring. His branches run over the water, over the wall. The archers bitterly attack him, shot at him, and harassed him severely, yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your father, who will help you by the Almighty, who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breast of the womb. The blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on your head, may they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoil. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. If you look in the very beginning of this chapter, verse 1 of chapter 49, Jacob calls his sons together, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. In some ways, Jacob is serving as a prophet of God here, telling each of his children what their planned destinies will be. And here's what we should see in this list of blessings this morning. What should the takeaway be? We hear through these sons blessings upon blessings and some of them curses. And we as people in 2022 might think, well, what is there for us in a list of blessings to 12 sons of Israel? Well, what we see in these blessings is this. God has provided for his children a savior king and through him an abundant amount of eternal blessings. God has provided for his children a savior king and through him an abundance of eternal blessings. And we could ask the question, what is God showing us through all the stories being combined in the Bible? And one answer could be given, what God is doing is providing for his children a savior king and through him an abundance of eternal blessings. That's how you could summarize the Bible. Each of the brothers play a part in bringing that redemption about. This sermon could have been 12 points, and at first it was, but then it was too long, and for your sake, I cut it back. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to group some of these brothers together, and some of the more famous ones to say we'll spend a little more time on. And so I'm going to start, I'm not going to go in the order of the text as it presents the brothers. I'm going to start with what I would say as least significant and progress to the more significant. And so for that reasons, we'll be jumping around in the text. You'll want to have your Bibles open. I'll be referring to different brothers at different points. Each one plays a role in bringing about God's plan to bring about the Savior King 
that will bless his children with abundant blessings. So first, we're going to start with a group of five. First, Jacob gives shorter blessings to five of his sons, Zebulun, Gab, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, and Issachar. Now, there's a lot to be said about each one of these, and I had written out some to be said, lots of interesting things here. Find a good commentary, read, lots of interesting details here. But I'm going fa- to follow the pattern of the author, and I'm going to spend very little time on these brothers, just like Moses did. So here's a brief summary of what you will hear about these five brothers. Verse 13, you see Zebulun will be a people of the sea. So all you people who feel like you're more at home at the beach than you are here, you may be a Zebulonite, okay, just for the record. Then you see Gad, verse 19. Gad will have a fighting future. It's what he talks about in being raided by raiders. He will be attacked, but ultimately he will raid them He's a fighter. He's a defender. This is the destiny for Gad. In verse 20, you have Asher. Asher is perhaps the chef of the family. His food will supply palaces and royal royalties. He will have delicacies for them. Verse 21, Naphtali will be a people of grace and fruitfulness. He's compared to a doe let loose in a fruitful field. And then finally in verse 14 and 15, you see Issachar. He's compared to a donkey. Lucky guy. His people will be content to be servants in a land they find prosperous. Issachar apparently is not all that ambitious. He looks at a land and it's a prospering land, it's a flourishing land, and he says, I'd like to dwell here, even if it means I'm gonna be in forced labor. Issachar is maybe perhaps, it's like settling to be the third best player on a championship team instead of a superstar on a last place team. So these are the first five brothers to consider. They're very short in what Jacob gives to them. They play a fairly small role in the future of Israel, but they have a place in God's redemptive history. But maybe we would say they're not the major players, And so you'll notice in the final seven brothers we go through, more content is given in their blessing. So that was the first five. Consider six, consider Dan. These are not the order of their births. It's just the order of what I'm considering them in. Six, consider Dan. Now there's a good common name. You have Issachar and Naphtali and Zebulun and then you had Dan, right? His blessing comes in verse 16 and 17. Notice that these blessings are getting longer. 16, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backwards. Dan appears to be a strong leader in the future, judging his tribe as one of the tribes of Israel. And then Jacob gives three statements concerning Dan, which to someone like me appear quite disturbing. Dan is compared to a serpent in the way, a viper by by the path, one that bites the horse's heel so that it raises up and the rider falls backwards. And immediately when we hear the comparison to a snake, we might think initially, Jacob is pointing to some sort of evil in Dan's future. And perhaps there's some there. I mean, many times we consider serpents in the Bible as connected to that great first serpent in the garden, the evil one. And we're right to make that connection. I mean, if you ask me concerning snakes, there are two types of people in the world. There are people who think snakes are evil, and then there are people who are wrong. And for those who think black snakes are good, I get it but it's kind of like saying the mafia keeps the streets clean in New York, right? (laughs) However, the reference here to snakes, I don't think is meant to primarily point us to an evil connotation with snakes. Instead, I think it's meant to show us the craftiness that Dan and his people will possess. They will be like a serpent in the way, making those who pass by a little hesitant 
to proceed more carefully, perhaps. They will be like a viper by the path, lying in the grass. And when the enemy passes by, they'll sniff at the horse's heel and strike their enemy. So they may not be the strongest of people, but they will be some of the more tricky. They will scheme and maneuver so as to defeat their enemies. You can read about one of these in Judges chapter 18. Interestingly enough, the tribe of Dan is the tribe that leads to Samson, where what happens? We see his strength exercise in Judges 15. But the trickery that one uses for strength when mishandled can be your downfall, as we see what happens with Delilah tricking him in Judges 16. This is the destiny for Dan. His people will flourish in their wit. They will be wise as serpents, but it will also be their downfall at times, like a snake that bites the heel. At some point, the animal that lies on the ground will be crushed by feet of people. Now, after Jacob gives this pronouncement to Dan, he takes a short break from his blessings of his sons, and he gives the most interesting line in verse 18. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Now that should stick out to us like a pink bumpered car. Jacob is in the middle of a formal speech, blessing his sons, taking no break. Naphtali, this is for you. Issachar, for you. Dan, for you. And he gets to the end of Dan and it's like he takes a deep breath and says, I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Now why would he do that? My best estimation is that he's passing the promise from son to son, and there might be a temptation to think salvation's going to come in one of them. One of these sons will be so blessed that in and of himself, he will fix this great curse. And it's almost here like Jacob is saying, boys, no matter how rich you are, Sons, no matter how strong you are, salvation belongs to God. And it is only in him. And for that reason, we wait for him to bring about salvation. I also don't think it's a coincidence that Jacob has just been talking about serpents with Dan. So that he remembers the great promise of God back in Genesis 3, 15, to send one through the descendants of the woman to crush the head of the serpent, the great serpent. So he's talking to Dan about his craftiness and then Jacob remembers, yes, serpents will be crushed. The great one will be crushed. And he cries out, I wait for your salvation, O Lord. His ultimate hope is in God, not his sons to finish the job. Zebulun, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Issachar, Dan. These are all names you've probably heard of, but certainly less familiar than the prominent ones. And so the next ones, we may be able to call the heavyweights. So number seven, consider Benjamin. Now Benjamin is the youngest. He's the baby of the family. And we might think that if there's ever going to be a bountiful blessing given, it will be to the babies in the family. We see verse 27, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey, at the evening dividing the spoil. We see his demeanor and destiny like that of a wolf, no mercy, devouring prey. And we might have in our minds this image of evil again, but again, I think this is meant to point out that the tribe of Benjamin actually will have a strength to them. One that's meant to paint a picture of aggressive warriors, the fiercest and successful in battle. This is a destiny for Benjamin. Eighth, consider Reuben. Now, if the youngest doesn't receive the top blessing, maybe the oldest will. After all, this was a firstborn dominant culture. What will Jacob say to his oldest and Leah's firstborn? We see his blessing In verse three and four, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the fruit, first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. 
It starts out strong, doesn't it? Jacob looks at Reuben. Ah, Reuben, you are my firstborn. You're my might, my strength. You are to be preeminent in dignity and, and power. But it will not come to Reuben. Verse 4, unstable as water are you. You shall not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Verse 4 says Reuben actually will be unstable as water. Reuben, the firstborn, should be that pitcher sitting on the table that will nourish all the family members with water, but instead he's the glass that tumbles over and spills into your lap. The firstborn should have position over the brothers, but Jacob says you won't. Why? Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. And it's like in, sh in shameful disbelief, Jacob's looking around at the brothers, looking down at him in his bed, and it's like, he went up to my couch, guys. You remember? If you weren't here that Sunday, this is referring to what Reuben did in Genesis chapter 35, verse 22. Years before, after Rachel had died, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, went and slept with Bilhah, her servant, his father's concubine. Now, that's bad enough, but in that culture, it was a scheme to overtake the prominent position in the family. And now Jacob says, son, because of your act of wickedness to usurp me and my authority, you shall have no authority at all. And it comes true. If you trace out the line of Reuben, it's pretty much disappearing in the land. No prophet, no judge, no king comes from him. Ninth and tenth, consider Simeon and Levi. Now this is a unique blessing because it's the only one that he gives together. We see his words in verse five through seven. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come into their counsel, not come into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they a hamstrung oxen. Curse be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now, first of all, why does Jacob start out and say, Simeon and Levi are brothers? Of course they're brothers. They're all brothers. Well, what is he pointing out? He's not pointing out their relation of brothers. He's pointing out their close relationship as perhaps the two closest siblings. Of all the brothers, they were united the tightest perhaps. If the top blessing doesn't fall to the youngest in Benjamin or the oldest in Reuben, well, maybe it will fall to the, the next in line, Reuben and Simeon, I mean, Simeon and Levi. However, right away we see this is not the case. Jacob says they are weapons of violence. Jacob is disgusted with them. Verse 6, let my soul come not into their counsel he says, when you guys are gathering around and you're trying to scheme and you're trying to plan, don't even consider me to be a part of your counsel. Oh, glory, let, oh, oh, let not my glory fall to them. Let me not be even associated with them. Now, why is there such a hard curse upon them? He says why in verse 6, for in their anger they killed men. And this is another reference to something that's already happened in Genesis. Do you remember back in Genesis 34? Jacob's daughter, Dinah, is sexually assaulted by a man, Shechem, from a neighboring nation. And then his father tried to cover it up by negotiations. And in response, the two brothers, rightfully angry, Simeon and Levi, did a good thing by seeking justice for their sister, but they took it too far in unjust ways. Do you remember what they did? They marched into the town. They slaughtered innocent people along the way. Jacob says, for that curse be your anger and wrath as punishment. I will divide and scatter you. 
And it comes true as well. The descendants of these brothers are scattered through the other tribes. No land is given to them. After the conquest of the land, Simeon pretty much disappears and the Levites are consigned to priestly work and no territory is given to be their own. The top blessing doesn't fall to the youngest or the oldest or not the, no, the two aggressive warriors. And there are two brothers left, the two most prominent. Who are they? Judah and Joseph. It's like the climax. It's like what we are waiting for. Let's start with Judah. Blessing comes in verse 8. And as I read through this, I want to point out several things. Verse 8, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Now notice it's going to be Judah's line that's going to receive the praise from his brothers. He says, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Judah's going to be strong in battle. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion. So all the kids in the room, what animal is the king of the jungle? The lion. I once went on a safari and we saw the zebra and the elephants, the hyenas. But what we were waiting to see was the lion. You go to the zoo and one of the busiest sections is the glass by the lion. It's the king of the jungle. He rules everything. He's strong and mighty and fierce. Jacob says, son, you'll be like a lion. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. Notice the kingship language here. Scepter in hand, staff between his feet on the, tr on the throne. And notice the last part of verse 10. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. His rule isn't just over God's people of Israel, but all the nations shall come to him in obedience. And verse 11 is very interesting. Still talking of Judah. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. Now, what does that mean? This is pointing out the prosperity that will flow in the line of Judah. Wine will be so abundant that people will come and they'll tie their donkeys to the choicest of vines because they won't even worry about the donkeys eating all the grapes because there'll be so much more to choose from. He says, son, your prosperity will be like washing your clothes in wine. I don't even worry about water. Just wash it in wine and just throw out whatever's left. There's going to be prospering wine. It's going to be flowing everywhere. To liken it to our day, <laughs> the prosperity under Judah's reign will be like washing your car in gasoline or feeding your pets baby formula. The best of resources, the one that everybody wants and prizes. Jacob says, they'll just flow freely under your prosperity. When you put the elements of Judah's blessing together, you notice four characteristics of Judah's future. Hang on in this. <laughs> I can't, this came to be one of my favorite texts in Genesis. Just watch what happens through Judah. Four elements of his blessing. Number one, he'll be strong as a lion. Number two, he'll rule as a king. Number three, he'll bring flowing prosperity. And number four, he'll demand the obedience of the nations. He'll be strong as a lion, rule as a king, bring flowing prosperity, demand the obedience of the nations. You mature Christians in the room, you're getting the connection I hope. And now notice, this is, this is what is said in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. And now if you follow the line of Judah, if you trace it out in biblical history, notice what happens. 
He'll be strong as a lion, and through his line comes the messianic title, the Lion of Judah. He'll rule as a king, and through his line, we see that kingship covenant flow to David, Israel's mighty king. But then it doesn't stop at David. It ultimately lands in Jesus Christ. All you have to do is flip to Matthew chapter 1. You'll see it's clear as day. The Old Testament ends, the New Testament begins, and there's basically a a three-pronged transition. Matthew chapter 1 says, through Jacob, it lists one son of Jacob, only one, Judah. Judah leads to David. David leads to Christ. Christ, the anointed one, like a king. Number three, Judah will bring flowing prosperity. And it's through his line we see that prosperity flow. Now, the author here, or Jacob, uses the imagery of wine to show prosperity. Don't miss the imagery of wine. Remember the donkeys are tied to the vine and we don't care, just let them eat the grapes, we got plenty more. And go wash your clothes in the, in the wine, it's, it's, it's just flowing like water, it's okay, there's tons of it. Where do we see in Judah's line flowing prosperity? Do you remember what Jesus' first public miracle was? He's at a wedding and they run out of wine So what does he do? He gets six stone, huge stone jars and he fills them up with water. And we're like, you can't serve water at a wedding? Jesus is like, you can if you're a Baptist. No, he doesn't say that. He takes the huge jars of water and he turns them to overflowing, prosperous wine. The people are amazed, like, where'd this come from? You saved the best until now? Jesus is not done with wine, though. At the very end of his life, in the upper room, he's eating with the disciples, and he takes the cup of wine. He takes the cup of wine, and he says, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Pointing to the blood that would flow from Jesus that would cleanse the record of sinners. So now the wine is connected to prosperity and is connected to the blood. Jesus does that. Judah will bring prosperity in his line. We see it flowing like wine and Jesus takes the cup and says, this is my blood. So that the prosperity of Judah is not in the earthly things per se. The prosperity that flows through Judah is the overflowing forgiveness that is offered in Jesus. He'll be strong as a lion. He'll rule as a king. He'll bring flowing prosperity. And number four of Judah's blessings, he'll demand the obedience of the nations. And through, and through Judah's line, the nations come. And Jesus gives the great commission, go, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. But that's not where it stops. We're doing that now. But one day, every knee will bow. Every knee of what? Every knee of every single nation and confess that Jesus is Lord. The blessing that comes through Judah is pointing to the line of the Messiah. It's so obvious when you trace it out in Scripture. So this is why I said at the beginning, God has provided for his children a Savior King. Not just a savior, but a king to rule. But not just a king to rule, but a savior to stand in our place. Jacob looks at his son and says, son, through you the lion will come. Through you the king will come. Through you the prosperity will flow. Through you the nations will bow in obedience before him. Friends, the one they were waiting to come came to be the savior king you and I needed. And not just for one nation only, 
but for all nations, that through Abraham the nations might be blessed. The wine that flows unrestrained under Judah, Jesus connects it to the blood that cleanses from sin. If you're newer to Christianity, if you're not a believer, you might say, gross. How does blood cleanse? Blood stains, not the blood of Christ. See, this is how it works. Because of your sin, God demanded death for your penalty. And death comes through, through the flowing of blood. See, God doesn't look at your sin and say, oh, don't worry about it. No, God is holy and he's perfect and he's, he's just. He will punish sinners. But right before he punishes the sinner, Jesus says, I'll take that sentence I'll shed my blood so that they don't have to. And he pays your debt and you get rewarded with his righteousness. It's the cleansing effect of Jesus and his sacrifice for you. And how do you receive, how do you receive such a gift? Through repentance and faith, turning away from your sin and turning to Jesus as the only one who can save you. And Jesus, the Savior who died for you, is the King who rose for you and now demands your life. He reigns over death. He reigns over all. He's the King we give our lives to and submit to and obey and cherish. He's the Savior King who came through the line of Judah. Now, it seems as though that would be the climax blessing, and perhaps it is. I didn't know who to put first, Judah or Joseph. But would you believe me if I told you it got a little bit better? For those of you keeping track, this is the 12th brother, which means this is the last point. What could be better than someone stepping up and taking your death sentence? You're there sweating bullets, dreading going to the gallows, and this man steps up and says, I'll take his place. He can go home to his family. You're like, whew, thank you. What could be better than that? Well, I don't know if it's better but it's just as good. What makes better the Savior who died is the Savior who becomes personal. It's one thing for a man to die for you 2,000 years ago and for you to watch from a distance like receiving an inheritance from a relative you never met. And that's one thing. It's one, that's another thing for that Savior to die, rise again, to come in personal nature to you reaching out the hands that were pierced for you and say, I will walk with you through your life. The one who named the stars is then the one who calls you by name. It's one thing to have a savior. It's another thing to have a personal savior. You know, it's one thing to have a king who has all authority on your side, but it's better to have a king who looks at you and blesses you with all the benefits of his kingdom. And it's one thing to go to a concert and see the rock star and he's walking through the crowd and he shakes your hand, he gives you a high five and you're like, woo, he, he loves me and he goes behind the stage and he forgets you. And this is not the kind of authority Jesus is. He's not a king who merely sits in a palace and looks down on those peasants in the marketplace. He's the king who opens his doors and says, come in and you can have the best of rooms. He's a personal savior, a personal king. And that's what we see in the final blessing given to Joseph. The blessing to the favorite son is seen in verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. It's an image of this tree planted by the stream of water. It gets so big and so fruitful that it begins to hang so low and it, gets, it begins to fall over the sides of the wall below. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, harassed him severely, yet his bow remained unremoved. His arms may, were made agile. Here Jacob describes the hardship Joseph went through. Like his brothers put him in slavery, like people attacking him, yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms remained, were made agile. He remained steadfast. Did not Joseph do that? How? 
Look at what Jacob says, by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. And then he describes the mighty one of Jacob. He says, from there is a shepherd. Listen to the personal language here. There is a shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will help you. Jacob says God is Joseph's shepherd. Maybe a first indication of what the psalmist would write in Psalm 23. The stone of Israel representing God's strength on Joseph's behalf. The God who will help you. He's your shepherd, your stone, the one who helps. He's personal. And then the focus turns to God giving blessings. Notice the last two verses, verse 25 and 26. Listen to the amount of language on blessing. By the Almighty, he will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breast of the womb, the blessings of your father and mighty beyond the blessings of my parents up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph. This is why I phrased the second half of the main point like this. God provided for his children a savior king. That came in Judah. A savior king that through him comes an abundance of eternal blessings that comes in Joseph. Because through the destiny of Joseph, as a lion receiving the blessing of God, we see the lion come in Judah and through him, his people will receive the God of Joseph, the shepherd over them, the rock of Israel, the God who will help, the almighty El Shaddai, Who can overtake him? Now, don't be confused. I'm I'm almost done here. Don't be confused with the language of prosperity. The prosperity and blessing of God to his people must not be over-realized in the here and now. And this is where prosperity preachers like Joel Osteen go wrong. And they want every day to be a Friday. The prosperity and blessing that comes from God is an eternal one. And the road to that eternal blessing is walking by faith through hardship and suffering now. It's the path of the prophets. It was the path of Jesus. It was the path of the apostles. But it is a path that leads to prosperity. True Christianity is a prosperity Gospel. Hear what I said. I did not say it is the prosperity gospel, but true Christianity has prosperity in Christ. It's just not one that's realized here. It's one that's realized there in a heavenly eternal kingdom. Ephesians 1, 3 makes this clear. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The problem with the prosperity gospel of today is that it promises too little. And what it does promise is not worth that much. But whatever God promises lasts eternally and is in every spiritual blessing in Christ. Two points of application and we're finished. First of all, Christians in the room God has provided for you a savior king and through him an abundance of eternal blessings. I'll just hear that as religious lingo. Persevere and stay the course. Keep the faith, press on. This light and momentary affliction of this planet earth does not compare to the weight of glory that God has prepared for you. And second, if you're not a Christian, (laughs) Don't you want this? Don't you want a savior that takes your sin and the guilt of it and pays the debt of it? Don't you want a king that rules over you graciously and generously? Don't you want eternal, secure blessings in Christ? The lion of Judah gives you his kingdom. Why would we look at this and turn away? The 12 sons of Jacob will now take their destinies into the wilderness, into the prophets, into wars and paths of rebellion and strife, into all the history that the Bible has for us. 
but they will not be abandoned because through Judah comes one to reverse the curse. The God of Joseph, the good shepherd who will lead them in every step of the way. He's the one we still follow today. Let's pray. Oh God, we give you praise for providing in Christ a savior king. One who has stored up for us in heaven a treasure that will not be stolen away. We know, Lord, the greatest treasure that we as Christians look forward to is Christ himself. Where we will hear his blessing fall upon our ears as well done, good and faithful servant. Oh God, bring, bring us to that day in continual repentance and faith. Let not our feet slip. Let not our hearts be distracted by worldly pleasures. Give us perseverance. Bring us home to that eternal golden shore. Let us see our blessing in Christ and make us content in that. In his name, amen.